Hey guys, Button Masher here, and welcome to my very first How to Chiptune video. If you're like me, and you love the sound of music that was made for retro consoles, like the NES, the SNES, the Sega Genesis, or any other retro console that was around during the 80s and 90s, you might be curious as to how you yourself can make music in the style of these consoles. There has never been a better time to get into making chiptune. There are an abundance of resources available for making this music, and my hope is that this video series will make using those resources a more approachable process for everyone. In this video, we're going to be talking about trackers, and we're going to break it up into three parts. In part one, we'll go over what a tracker is and why it's the optimal sequencer to use when making chiptune. In part two, we'll go over all of the basic functions of the tracker. And in part three, we'll go over the transcription method. This is the method that I use to learn tracking. In this part, we'll be recreating a completed tracker module in a blank one. Through this process, you will learn all of the basic mechanics required to make this music. So let's get to it. A tracker is a music sequencer in which music data is read from top to bottom in text format. The sequence is written within what we call a channel, which produces one monophonic voice at a time. Each column within a channel represents a different aspect of the sound. For an in-depth look at the history of trackers, check out Ahoy's video on the subject. The link is in the description. You might be saying to yourself, this sounds hard. Why would I want to use this sequencer to make chiptune instead of the sequencer I'm already comfortable with? Unlike other sequencers, many trackers are designed with the express purpose of making chiptune. The sound chips that were utilized in these old consoles and arcade boards are unique synthesizers with a very specific set of capabilities. Certain trackers can make exploring these capabilities a very straightforward process. Another important feature of the tracker is the high level of control you are given for automating volume, effects, and swapping presets. In my experience, being able to automate in this way is critical to making chiptune that sounds full and vibrant. With this technique, one can make two monophonic channels sound like much more than that. Several trackers even allow you to export your song in a file format that can be played on a console. This is not always the case, but it's still a great reason to learn tracking if you're interested in such things. For this demonstration, we're going to take a look at Furnace Tracker. When I tell you this tracker is an absolute miracle for anyone looking to make chiptune, it's not an exaggeration. Furnace Tracker allows you to write music for an impressive array of consoles and sound chips. I've got to give massive props to Tildarrow and their crew for making this software and releasing it to the public for free. The link is in the description. Let's take a look at a sample module. Here we have a piece that I wrote for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Let's first examine the main grid. This is also known as the pattern window. You will do all of your sequencing here. The NES has five channels. Two channels that produce pulse waves, one that produces a triangle wave, one that produces noise, and a DPCM channel which can play back samples. Within each of these channels, we have a note column, an instrument column, a volume column, and multiple columns for effects. Let's take a closer look at what's going on in each of these columns. The note column is simple. You have your pitch and the octave number of that pitch. To enable note input, hit the space bar. To disable it, hit it again. Entering pitches in your tracker can be made easy by connecting a MIDI controller of your choice and simply playing the notes in. I highly recommend doing this if you don't like the idea of entering notes with a virtual piano on your computer keyboard. If you don't have a MIDI keyboard, 
Here's a diagram of how notes are mapped on the computer keyboard. If we enter a note into our pattern window and we play our pattern, the note will play indefinitely until the next note or until a note cut. To install a note cut, hit 1 on your computer keyboard in the note column. The instrument column allows you to choose presets that you've made in the instrument editor window. We'll take a more in-depth look at the instrument editor window later on. Here's an example demonstrating the potential of instrument swapping in the instrument column. The volume column simply changes the volume output of the channel. The volume column will be important for getting the levels right for each channel in your piece, but it can also be used to create delays and echoes. The effects channel allows you to trigger vibratos, pitch slides, detuning, and a wide variety of other features. To find which commands trigger which effects, we simply need to open the effects list. As you explore other sound chips in Furnace, you will notice that some effects are specific to certain sound chips. Let's trigger some effects. Here we have a short melody written for this pulse channel with no effects. Let's add some duty cycle automation. This will change the width of the pulse wave that this channel produces. Like we observed in the note column, effects also need to be manually turned on and off. Let's try this with vibrato. Here we have a vibrato with a speed of 7 and a depth of 4. To turn this off, enter another vibrato command, but set the speed and depth both to 0. You may be noticing a combination of letters and numbers present in the effects, instrument, and volume columns. This is because many trackers use a hexadecimal system. That means there are 16 characters that are used to represent all of the possible value for volume, effects, and instrument numbers. This can be a little intimidating at first, but with enough practice, you'll get used to using this system. This system is necessary so that three figure numbers can be represented with two characters, thus keeping the columns orderly and easy to follow. Let's dive into the instrument editor window. This is where we can create instruments. Think of an instrument as a synth preset. To create a new instrument, simply hit the plus button. The type of instrument that you can create is determined by the sound chip you're writing for. In the case of the NES, we can create an NES instrument or a generic sample instrument. The pulse channels, the triangle channel, and the noise channel all use NES instruments, while the DPCM channel uses a generic sample instrument. Within the NES instrument, you can adjust the volume envelope, add an arpeggiation, include duty cycle automation, adjust the pitch envelope, or include a phase reset. Let's make a generic sample instrument now. In order to create a usable sample instrument, we must have samples uploaded to our Samples tab. After you've uploaded the sample you want to use, return to the Instrument tab and select the sample instrument you've created. Choose the sample you want to use in the initial sample pull-down menu. If you want to create a drum kit, try using Furnace's Sample Map feature. This will save you the trouble of having to type a different instrument value every time you want to change drums. To access any of the instruments we've created, simply click the instrument you want to use with your mouse and enter the notes with your MIDI keyboard or computer keyboard. Before we move on, I want to reiterate that there are a wide variety of sound chips available to program for with Furnace. I encourage you to explore the instrument editor in the context of FM chips like the YM2612, heard on the Sega Genesis, 
or wavetable chips like the HUC6280 heard on the TurboGrafx-16. Let's take a look at the speed tab. The way tempo is defined in trackers is a little bit difficult to explain. I want to give a special thanks to a chiptune artist by the name of Petty Penal for helping me with this section. In trackers, the overall speed of a song is measured in units known as ticks. You'll notice that at the top of the speed tab, our first control is the tick rate. This is also referred to as the clock speed. This control determines how many ticks are played per second. This can be used to set a base BPM directly, and Furnace even allows you to do it directly if you click the button. If you plan to play the song on real hardware, changing this setting is not recommended, as it might not be supported by some players or consoles. The speed setting will determine how many ticks each row will play for. The lower the number, the faster it plays. This will work together with the clock speed setting to determine the final BPM. For example, with the clock speed set at 60 Hz and the speed at 6, it will play 150 BPM. But if the speed is changed to 3, it'll play at double that speed, or 300 BPM, since it's only half the amount of ticks per row. Faster speeds allow for more flexibility and more detail to be added to the song, and at the same time, lower speeds allow for simpler tracking and a more compact view of your work. There are many ways to approach speed and tempo. It's important for you to find which speed you're most comfortable working in. The transcription method in part 3 may help you determine which speed is best for you. Here are a few examples of speed and tempo being used differently across several different modules. With the highlight setting, you can make the grid highlight a row in specified increments. By default, this is used to determine the beats and measures of the song, like in a DAW, but you're free to use it as you want. All three of these settings will define the BPM of the song. While the track is being played, Furnace will display the resulting BPM at the top of the screen. Furnace uses the first highlight setting as the beat duration for this calculation, and you can use it as a reference to tweak the settings until you get the exact BPM that you want. To wrap up, the pattern length will determine how many rows are present in each frame of the song. As a rule of thumb, you should adjust this according to how many measures you want each frame to contain. Here we have the orders window. This window is a spreadsheet that shows the order in which patterns will be played in your composition. To the left, we have the order of the frames. On top, we have the abbreviated channel names. In the middle, we have our pattern numbers. This window affords users the flexibility to use any pattern at any point in their composition, simply by clicking to change the pattern number. On the far right, we have a handful of buttons that can make editing individual patterns or groups of patterns much easier. Let's take a look at one final feature before we move on to my recommended method for learning this software. These are the play edit controls. Most of these are self-explanatory, as you've likely encountered them in various music sequencers. I highly recommend memorizing the hotkeys for these controls. The step button is perhaps one of the most important tools to making your tracking experience much easier. If this is set to 1, entering a note or effect will move the cursor to the next row. 
If it's set to a larger number, rows will be skipped. If this is zero, the cursor will stay in place. This can make typing in certain rhythms much less of a chore. In the final part of this video, we're going to put everything we just learned into practice. We're going to take a completed tracker module and recreate it from scratch. It was through this very process that I was able to pick up tracking in less than a month. I'm confident it will work for you too. The first thing we need to do is open two windows of Furnace. To do this on Windows, simply hit the desktop icon for Furnace twice. To do this on a Mac, you'll need to download two separate versions of Furnace and open both of them. After we have both of our windows open, we need to open the module that we want to recreate in both windows. I will include links to sample modules of my own in the description, but there are also plenty of demo modules on the Furnace GitHub for you to download. You can do this exercise with any module but I would suggest starting with a module that has fewer channels. After we have the sample module of our choice loaded in both windows, delete all of the sequencing information in all of the patterns in one of the windows. After you've done this, save this window as transcription. Now we can begin the recreation process. I suggest recreating the sample module one channel at a time and one pattern at a time. As you work, experiment with taking out certain effects and putting them back in to see what it does to the sound. Also, make sure to have your effects list open at all times so that you can see exactly how effects are being used in the sample module. Be sure to check that your transcription sounds like the original. As you go through this process, you will start to develop the muscle memory and knowledge necessary to use this software efficiently. Hey guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and in the comments, let me know any chiptune related topics you'd like me to cover in the future. I'd also greatly appreciate it if you considered joining my Patreon. For only $3 a month, you get access to every MIDI file and project file for every song that I make before it comes out. I want to give a special thank you to Cosmic Gem, Defense Mechanism, Dammy Fortune, Aman, and Piripanal for helping me with this video. The links to their music and socials are in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of How to Chip Tune.